<laughs> TEDx! <laughs> this talk is going to be about several things. Sufi poetry, the relative, the absolute, music, theater, musical theater, Zen Buddhism, and a little thing I like to call my fucked up shit. I'm going to ramble a little, but we'll end with a song, so everything will be OK. I hope. Many years ago, I was on the floor of a cabin in uh, Mount Tremper, New York, in the middle of the woods. I was at the Zen Mountain Monastery at the end of a two-week silent retreat. Uh, I had been sitting in front of a wall for eight hours, meditating. I went down to the dining hall afterwards. Someone put a bowl of vegetables in front of me. Steam was coming up. And I have a very vivid memory still of how intimately I felt this bowl of the steam and the vegetables and everyone around me and everything around me. So that's the first vignette. Fast forward, I think it was about three months, I'm online in a for a movie in New York City with a friend. And a stranger comes up to me and says uh, that he had heard my most recent album at the time and he loved this particular song. And uh, it meant a lot to him. And I said, thank you. It's yours, too. And he seemed to like that. And he walked away. And my friend said, what did you mean by that? It's yours, too. And <clears throat> I had said it without thinking. And I answered my friend without thinking that I felt like, yes, I had written this song, but so had he. And so had my friend. And so had everyone. And uh, that was probably mentally the healthiest period of my life. <laughs> <laughs> um, fast forward another few months, maybe six months, and my first Broadway show, The Full Monty, opens to really good reviews and uh, good box office. And I'm getting praise, I'm getting pats on the back, I'm getting checks. And I go to the theater a couple of weeks after we open, and I go to my mailbox. There's a small envelope, and it's a handwritten card from one of my beloved Zen teachers. It's got one sentence on it. May your practice sustain you in these difficult times. <laughs> I, <laughs> I already knew what she meant. Um, <clears throat> I had invested a lot of time in the seven to 10 years before that thinking of myself, uh, cementing my identity, as a recording artist uh, with an emphasis on the artist. Um, I like to feel like I was at the cutting edge of a certain kind of rock music. The studio was my instrument, you know. And uh, here we were, here, here I was with a Broadway hit. I was a Broadway composer, jazz hands. <laughs> and I had a hard time with that. <laughs> I had a hard time not being conflicted about that. I sort of justified my success as a Broadway composer and my identity now as a Broadway guy by saying, oh, this is my day job. This is a great day job. I was writing Dirty Rotten Scoundrels. I was like, this is fun. It's a great day job. I'm making money so I can support my art. When you hear the word art used like that, it's like a little bit of a douche chill um, when I say it this way. Um, so and my art. I mean, listen, I like my albums. I like the songs that I wrote for my albums. A lot of them ask questions like, uh, who am I? Who are you? Who are we? Um, these are questions that are valuable to ask. These are also questions that, and uh, now I'm going to address this to writers in the room, writers, many of whom are very good procrastinators. I'm a master procrastinator. If you uh, use those questions when you should be writing, um, they are distractions. They get in the way. Uh, questions like, should I be doing this? Is this who I am? This is chatter. This is chatter that gets in the way of unity. <laughs> unity uh, means, in, in this case, being in the moment. Uh, if you're truly in the moment, you really do feel like you're kind of one with everything. Um, creation, I think, demands unity. 
You've got to get to that point. And for some of us, it could take hours. It could, it could take months to get to the point of just relaxing and feeling like you're in the moment. Art created in unity begets unity with your collaborators, with an audience, with other people. We're all hungry. We're hungry for entertainment. We're hungry for catharsis. But these are distractions, really. Um, what we're really starving for is connection and uh, with other people, with everything around us, with, uh, with God. It's one way of putting it. And while researching and writing The Band's Visit, my most recent show, uh, I read a lot of uh, the Sufi poet Rumi, who I've always been a big fan of, um, who constantly sings the praises of unity with everyone, with everything. Here's a, a Rumi quote that stuck with me. Silence gives answers. Uh, duh. <laughs> you know, stop the monkey voices in your brain and you'll find some truth. Another quote from Rumi, why are you knocking at every door? Go knock at the door of your own heart. How will they perceive me? Why is he more successful than me? Why didn't my last show make money? If it's Women on the Verge, why didn't it make any money? Uh, <laughs> there, uh, here's another Rumi quote, there's a voice that doesn't use words, listen. The band's visit is a piece that asks you to listen, if you've seen it. Um, sometimes it gives you silence to help you. Uh, and we're very proud of this, my collaborators and I. There's a character in the band's visit, his name is Khaled, a handsome young member of the Egyptian police orchestra, he's a big Chet Baker fan, who seems at first to be a would-be pickup artist, constantly dogging women, but who has a real generosity of spirit I've seen him from the beginning as a hidden Sufi master. He doesn't know it. Uh, <clears throat> when Poppy, another character, an awkward Israeli guy, asks him for advice about speaking to girls, there's a song that I saw as an opportunity for him and for me to take a page from Rumi and other spiritual poets and add a layer to the advice about finding romantic love and deepen the metaphor to speak about unity, connection, oneness. The show is full of characters who are longing to connect. Haled's song about love, it's the name of the song, is a blueprint if you listen to it the right way, a blueprint for connection. In the lyrics, I'm borrowing thoughts and sentiments from Sufi poets, Zen poets, from the Bible, from Psalms, but it's okay. I wrote them too, and so did you. <laughs> These are universal truths that lie underneath the whole catastrophe of life. Here's my favorite Rumi quote. Union is a raging river running toward the sea. Tonight the moon kisses the stars. Oh, beloved, be like that to me. This is for you. try to do this. Major. Not break the eyes, you melt the eyes, you melt yourself. Soon you're all one puddle. You talk, she talks. It's not about the conversation. Your words are like your lips are reaching out to kiss the ear. You're here, she's here. Two drops of water, the pull, the pull, invisible but really real. Your eyes, her eyes, soon you're looking in a mirror. You realize you can't get nearer. You are both right there.
Sam Sadagurski. You glow, she glows, you can applaud. Two suns, no shadow, your skin, her skin, and everything's all light. No edge, no edge, no walls, no borders, two streams of water that becomes the sea. The dance, the dance. You see the wind that moves the trees is. The algebra that moves your knees is written in her eyes. Her eyes, your eyes. You're only looking in a mirror. You realize you can't get nearer. And there's no way. Don't me Thank you.